Welcome to the Vine Resources Podcast Show with your host, David Lawrence. Welcome to another edition of the Vine Resources Podcast Show. Well, today I'm delighted to have on the line with me Jack Weldy. Jack Weldy is the uh, CEO of Smartling over in New York in the USA. Jack, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, David. Delighted to be here. I uh, hope it's a sunny day for you where you are right now. It's actually gorgeous. So, you know, obviously, um, you know, we're all in lockdown. I don't know when your podcast is going to air exactly, but we're all in lockdown right now still. Um, we're in the New York City area, which has been very hard hit uh, right now. But I'm actually sitting outside in my yard. The sun is shining. You may hear birds in the background. And it's one of the first days to actually get outside. And frankly, I kind of needed it after being on lockdown for, you know, over two months now. <laughs> well, well, we're going to touch on that in a minute, Jack, because I'd love to have your insights for it. What, Jack, just before Excellent. we get started, if you could share with our listeners just a little bit about who you are and, and Smartlink, please. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, so Smartlink is a, a company that helps other companies to translate and localize their digital content into multiple languages. So Companies come to us when they need to translate their website or their marketing materials or training materials, whatever it may be, into multiple languages, French, German, Spanish, Chinese, Hebrew, whatever the languages are that are appropriate. And we have a technology platform and a service that helps companies to do that very efficiently, very effectively, and produces really high quality translations that are on brand that are appropriate for your hotel group, your software company, your e-commerce company, your travel and luxury, luxury uh, company, your automotive company, whatever it, whatever it may be. We've been in business about 10 and a half years. A um, little, about, little bit about me. Um, so I'm the founder and CEO of the company. My background is in computer engineering with a um, concentration in linguistics uh, from university. I've been involved in startups for much of my career in technology startups uh, sold my first company to apple um, out of out of college and have been involved in technology companies pretty much ever since and i spent about 10 years in the middle as a as a military pilot with the u.s air force and saw the world did lots of interesting things fantastic wow i'm sure you've got some great stories there and jack just out of interest who, who um i don't know if you've got any stats or any information on organizations who perhaps before they've gone through that transition of translating and and the value add that it's brought to their business what what what, what how does it how does it impact companies who who take advantage of your service yeah there's lots of stats on on this and there's a couple different organizations that have done research and we have our own research on this as well but some of the stats that we hear are you know things like i mean first of all it's it's pretty obvious you know if you want to sell to someone you really need to be speaking in their in their native language if you want to have a connection with someone you really need to be speaking in their native language and so there's a lot of stats that say things like you know um you know something pretty close to about 60% of people you know don't want to check out on your e-commerce site if it's not in their native language even if they're comfortable with english and i think that's that makes a lot of sense but we also see stats that say that when companies do translate and localize their content, and especially in a world where you know everybody's buying online, everybody is. I mean, is, is the pandemic certainly has has taught us that it really is a small world, and we're all experiencing the exact same thing globally. You know, if you are not providing your products and service in in people's languages, they're not going to buy. And so we see oftentimes that there's a 5x, 10x, 20x, even 25x return when companies translate and localize their digital content. Fantastic. And what's, what's the sort of process and the technology that, that a company would go, go through and benefit from in, in, in utilizing yourselves? Yeah, so it's interesting. You know, a modern company that is has a website, has a mobile app, has marketing content, marketing emails, has different campaigns that they run. A modern company has a lot of different platforms where they create and store and broadcast that content. It could be a content management system for their website. It could be an e-commerce platform for their e-commerce site. It could be a mobile application development tool that they use for their mobile applications. It could be a source code repository where developers are storing all of their source code. It could be, you know, support content where you, you know, where somebody might say, hey, I'm having a problem with something can, and I'm, I want to go look for that support content. So the modern enterprise today has somewhere between, you know, five and 25 different places where they are storing and creating and syndicating that, that content. And so what Smartlink is able to do is to hook into all of those different places. And then when somebody creates content that says, oh, this probably should be in French, German, and Spanish, or whatever the languages are, 
then SmartLink can capture that content, pull it into our platform, put it into the right workflow, and figure out how to actually translate that content. And then when it's translated in a very high quality appropriate way, it automatically deploys it back into that platform. It just makes it a lot easier for companies to be able to, to, to do that. Fantastic, fantastic. And look, you know what? I was going to ask you what a tradition, what a typical day in the business looks like for you. I'm going to ask you ask that bird in the corner to, to ask <laughs> if you ask him to yeah. tone it tone it down a little bit. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, we were we were talking about a typical day in the business, and and then you mentioned to me just off off air about you know going outside, enjoying the birds. T- tell me what. Tell me about the the day, how it looks now in a in a post COVID world right now, but also how how is it impacting your own well being as a as a as a founder, and and what changes. What positive changes have come from it for you? Yeah, you know, it's 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 a super interesting question. And I I was when we were talking off air, if you had asked me this question three months ago, I would have talked about, you know, that we have, you know, five offices in in New York and London and Dublin and two offices in Ukraine and and you know, we we run a globally distributed team and here's what a typical day looks like. But obviously that has changed really dramatically in the last uh, in the last few few months, ever since sort of early March, we've we've been on lockdown down in New York, and and I moved the entire company into a into a work from home, shelter in place sort of posture um, back in 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 early March, in the first half of of March, and certainly that has been a dramatic change for everybody. I mean, I think I think we were really pretty set up. We were set up pretty well because we used a lot of business to business tools like. Google Docs and Slack and Atlassian and and SmartLing, which is a cloud-based platform, of course. So I think we were in a better place to be able to continue to conduct business than a lot of businesses are, but it certainly hasn't been easy. It certainly has been unusual. And we've kind of had to make it up as we as we as we go along. We've found that um, you know, we found that I found as a leader that, you know, trying to lead and manage a hyper distributed team of, you know, of hundreds of people around the world has suddenly become much more challenging. When we have a, a company all hands meeting, it's it's kind of me talking into a laptop and I can't read the body language or mm-hmm. or see the feedback from 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 my my company employees and so on. We found that, you know, a startup that tends to be a lot more ad hoc by nature, we've had to build in more checklists and and documented processes and and run books and and even as we recruit additional people you know who will probably never show up in an office for the next who knows six to 12 months if ever um, that's been a change in sort of thinking about how do we create a more rigorous onboarding process for new em- employees so I think we're doing pretty well but boy it's a it's a brave new world and it's uh, it's certainly been interesting well you talk about that and um, you know where people may never go back in an office how 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 can organizations plan, do you think, for that for that change and, you know, where they might have real estate that's costing them hundreds and thousands of pounds or dollars, you know, and, and how do they how do they manage to, to navigate that path, do you think? I think that's a really interesting question. And, um, you know, and this answer may or may not age well, depending on what, <laughs> when this airs. Of course. When somebody goes back and listens to this six or 12 months from now, it's either going to be incredibly profound or, or completely off target here. But, you know, as of, as of, you know, early May or mid May uh, of 2020, I think that, I think it's a really interesting question for companies. And we do fall into that category where we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars and pounds uh, and euros on, uh, on office space. And we have beautiful, you know, exciting um, collaborative office spaces, which are going empty right now, which are going unused right now. And as you know, what we're finding is that out of my, you know, hundreds of employees, that some of them have never been more productive. My developers, my um, more introverted folks, my tech and data folks, and not to generalize too much, I think frankly have found that not commuting and and being able to just you know stay focused on the work that they're doing has been incredibly productive. On the other hand, I think some of my folks that you know again not to generalize too much, but tend to be more sort of um, extroverted, my salespeople, my marketing people, people that thrive on being in, in groups and interacting with other people, I think that they're finding this to be more of a more of a, of a, of a challenge. As a CEO, I'm looking at this as an opportunity to reinvent ourselves a little bit here. I don't know when we're going back to the office. I don't know when we're going to have sufficient tests and sufficient tests of who's you know, who's had COVID and has the antibodies and had a test on an ongoing basis. I don't know whether, you know, people in the company are going to be incredibly excited about going back to the office. I think some are, or other people who are, have a little bit of trepidation about it. Like maybe I have an underlying health condition and I'm not, 
I'm concerned about what this might look like to go to go back into the office. So I, I suspect that the future will be somewhat of a flex. Uh, you know, I'm I'm in the office, but I'm also working remotely. And frankly, for a little while, it's going to be a lot of remote work that's punctuated by in-office meetings, in-office training sessions, things like things like that. And and, and I'm trying to figure out like. Do we actually need an office that is as big? You know, the office is as big as they are. Is it better to have something that I can flex, you know, bigger or smaller on demand uh, from there? There's no question as a leader that that I think it's much more difficult to lead people when you when everybody is remote. I you, there's unquestionably it's better to have people in the office and you can look people face to face. But 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 wow, it's it's just, just it's a very different world right now, and I think we're trying to figure it out. Now, and, and that leads on nicely, actually, to that that point around, you know, it could work well, very well for your senior, you know, senior people who can get on with their role. What about those, you know, the, the, the graduates or the interns or, or the junior members that, that need that more face to face coaching? How, how do you think organizations will will adapt for that? Well, I think I think we see it in, in the use of Zoom and Microsoft meetings and other other products uh, for that. And um but I think it's going to be a little bit different. I mean, we're we're still I still consider us a startup, even though we're you know ten and a half years in the making at this point. Um, I still think of us as a startup, and that means that we tend to be sort of you know more ad hoc in our in our processes and so on. But as we recruit newer people, as we recruit recent graduates, as we onboard people, I think that we will have to put more discipline and rigor in what those processes look like. What are the checklists for how we hire people? And I think frankly. You know, there's going to be kind of an expectation um, that that I think candidates and companies will need to meet each other halfway. I think that a candidate that sort of assumes, hey, I just thought that the company was going to, you know, meet me 90 percent of the way there and just sort of spoon feed me everything that I need to know in a post covid world, I think is not going to work particularly well. And I think companies that think, you know, hey, I just expect my candidates to roll with the punches. And yeah, we're all distributed remotely and you've never met any of your teammates in person, but hey, do a great job. I don't think that works either. I think we're going to have to kind of find ways to meet in the middle um, as we onboard you know, new employees and especially younger people who don't have as much experience in the workforce or trying to learn a new product or the new standards of a company or even just the, you know, how a company thinks, the core values, how they make decisions and so on. I think it's going to be a challenge. Mm. What what t- can you tell us a few of the things that you've been doing to keep your keep your people engaged? Yeah, so so one I've I, I send a weekly meet a weekly email um, usually on the weekends that I uh, to the entire company, and it's it's sort of intended to be a here's some of the things that are going on here's some of the things that are on my mind, and I think particularly in a time when there's a lot of uncertainty. You know, there's there's a big difference between risk and uncertainty. Risk, you can sort of, you can identify risks, you can predict risks, you can quantify risks, you can say, hey, here's some risks, and here's how we're going to try to mitigate those risks. But there's so much uncertainty right now where people just don't know the answer. I think people are looking to their leaders to say, when can I go back to work? And I don't think the leaders really know. And so, you know, I try to send an email out weekly that says, here's what's on my mind. Here's the way I'm thinking about it. Here's the the framework that I would use to sort of think about how we would go back to work. Here's some of the things that we haven't figured out yet. Here's some of the things that are going really, really well in the company. And here's some things that I think are too soon to tell or that, you know, frankly, are a little soft or things that we, you know, probably could do a little bit better. So I try to send a weekly uh, email that I think generally um, uh, is a good way of communicating with the team. The other thing I do is, um, and, you know, hopefully this won't sound too terribly sort of artificial, but I have an org chart and I basically kind of go down the org chart and I try to reach out to five to 10 people on the team every week. And I just reach out to them by email or in Slack or some other way. And I just kind of say, Hey, how's it going? You know, what's, what's going on what's your situation? How are things going right now? Um, you know, there's, there is a lot of fear and trepidation in, in the, you know, in the, in the, in the world right now in the workforce and, you know, so many people have lost their jobs. I think we're at, you know, 39 million, you know, us, Workers are out of work right now. Um, this announced this week. Um, so when I send that message, I include a lot of exclamation points and a lot of you know smiley face emojis and thumbs up emojis just to make it clear that hey, I'm I'm reaching out just to say hey I care. I I'm curious what's going on in in your situation. Many of my employees are in are in big cities like New York and London and Dublin, and 
you know, and, and frankly, some of them are in challenging living conditions. You know, they may live by themselves in a really tiny apartment that they only intended to ever kind of sleep in. And, you know, maybe they don't have a good internet connection and they're kind of lonely. And I think that's a really challenging environment. Some of my employees have small children and they're trying to figure out how to work and live and take care of their children at the same time. And so I just try to reach out and just be like, hey, how's it going? How can I be helpful? Um, some of my employees give me a very quick response. And frankly, some of them write a book <laughs> and, and want to have a conversation. And I'm happy to do both. These are, mm. these are, these are weird times. These are strange yeah. days. Totally get it. Totally get it. Um, what, are, what are you? What are you hearing, David? What are you hearing that other companies are doing? Maybe I'll pick up a tip on this one of what what we should be doing in this hyper distributed world. What I should be doing as a CEO. I think um, I think you, you obviously said a lot of those things. It's it's obviously st people are staying staying close to the team. Lots of people are obviously doing lots of different uh, quizzes and games on Zoom. You know, getting yeah. together every week. Someone's leading that off. There might be. Well, that might be traditionally more English, but, uh, you know, drinking games on a Friday with a with a team um, coming up with different ideas of connecting, connecting with people. WhatsApp groups, uh, Slack groups, as you said, Slack channels being available. Um, I think just hearing other people's stories. So I think people are also sharing from their employers what other people are doing. Um, and I think I think I think all of those things, it's trying to keep everyone close. So I think you, you hit the nail on the head there. I think some people are. It, it's pretty lonely speaking to other candidates. Motivation is one of the things that I'm hearing a lot. So yeah. whether that's people in, in work or out of work, um, you know, their routine, some people's routine is 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 completely broken. Um, you know, if you were going to the gym a few months ago, perhaps your gym is still shut in some places, certainly for, for, for us. Um, what are they doing and how are they changing that routine? So I don't know, are you, do, are you, are you what are you doing as well around that motivation? How, how do you think people can motivate your, your, your own employees or, or themselves, what, what's, what's the best way forward, do you think? Yeah, I think some of it is just is, is, is self-discipline and, and that people have to kind of find that, that way themselves. I have a park that's about 100 meters from my house that I try to take a, you know, at least a three mile you know, walk every single day or, or go for a run. Um, you, know, you know, personally, that's kind of my, my mental space because I think it is too easy in this work from home environment to kind of roll out of bed at six in the morning and then you find yourself rolling back in, into bed at 10 mm -hmm. o'clock at night and you know wait i didn't even leave the room there um and so i i think that you know people have to you know they've got to take care of themselves <laughs> they've got to take a shower and brush their teeth and they've got to you know get outside and and you know see the sunlight and 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 exercise and 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 eat healthy i you know personally i'll, I'll share that you know, I found it a little bit too easy to, you know, eat a lot of, you know, comfort foods and cook a bunch of stuff up in the Instapots and, and, uh, you know, and eat a lot of, you know, bread with, you know, with delicious jam on it and things like that, that frankly, when I, you know, I probably didn't do when I was, you know, when I was, you know, racing back and forth into the, in, in, into work and so on. And so, um, but I think that's, I think that's, a, that's a part of just sort of like living your life and continuing to make sure that, you, that, 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 that you do that. We know from a work perspective, we do try to share a lot of metrics of the things that are going well. We try to celebrate the wins that we have. We try to find the small victories, whether it's deals that are coming in that we're excited to land, whether it's, you know, hitting certain targets, whether it's people celebrating, you know, life events and birthdays. Um, and I liked a lot of your suggestions as well. We have a, we have a team that takes care of, uh, of some terrific people on the team that, that think about and are frankly a lot better than me at, at the, you know, the culture uh, games and the trivia nights and the, and the, you know, BYOB, you know, sort of events over zoom and things like that. That's been going really, really well. I That's like great. Suggestions. I, I do you know, I haven't shared this with anyone on, 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 um, on anything live recently, but, um, I actually, um, I actually went through the symptoms of the virus about seven weeks ago and, and oh, some really? of, yeah. And some of the things that it, it went on for about six weeks, hallucinations, mm. funny dreams at night, um, you know, lethargic, my legs were, were super tired, like couldn't even get up in the morning. But recently, uh. what recently what I've done in the last two weeks is, like you said, I've got up at seven, walked outside, sat on a bench and done a, a breathing meditation for 10 minutes. And I think yeah. you're I think you're right there, even if you're in a wherever you are, you know, if you can get out for 10 minutes in the morning, even if you don't feel like running or doing any exercise to completely even if you can go out and just breathe, breathe some air and, and see some daylight, um, that's super important. Um, I totally agree with that. Well, I'm sorry that you went through that, David. And, uh, well, and, and are, are you feeling better now? 
well, I'm out the other side. So, um, you know, well, I, I, for anyone who's who's been through it or going through it, you know, just uh, keep 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 positive. Is there is there um you know you you, you just touched on a, a great mention point of you being in the in the armed forces um, um, for ten years? I yeah. think I'm sure you, I'm sure you've got some great stories there. But is there is there any stories that you've got from your your childhood or even maybe your 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 military career that influenced your work ethic and later life that you could share? If there was one one that you could share with us. Well, I'll, I'll admit that a lot of the ways that that um, we have structured the business and uh, the way that we make decisions and sort of the core values that we use in the in the in the company, I, I stole a lot of them from 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 the military. And it's not just the U.S. military. It's it's you know, it's, it's the British military. It's, you know, lot, lots of 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 military organizations have similar sort of ideas around. Um, things like, you know, good today is better than perfect tomorrow or, you know, and, and said in different ways, like when when something comes up and we're going to figure out the plans of what we're going to do, we plan it to about a 70 percent level and then we start executing. Why do we not get it to 100 percent? Because you're never going to get to 100 percent. You're never going to get perfect. And instead, it's better to do that planning, which is critically important, but get it to about a 70 percent level and recognize that you're always operating on some form of imperfect information and start executing because your plan's going to change. You're going to learn things. The market's going to tell you certain things, and then you can continue to modify, you know, from, from, from that. I would say that that is one of our core values. And I think the other one, you know, we've got five of them. I won't go through all of them, but the other one that, that certainly the military um, makes, you know, certainly taught me and, and is a really, really important one. Our, our anchor core value is take care of our people. Now, that's not an easy thing to always do, and, and I can't pay every single person in my company a million dollars or a million pounds a year and give them all 360 days of vacation a year. That's not taking care of our people, but there are ways to think about what is the right balance between the needs of the individual, the needs of the company, the needs of our clients and partners? How do we take care of our people? How do we be thoughtful about you know, what their individual needs are? And frankly, the last two and a half months in the COVID world, have been a, a, a crash course in this about, you know, trying to be more mindful about the individual needs of, of our, of our employees. And, you know, I, I include in our people, our customers, our, our partners, our applicants, um, you know, are we, are we being mindful about the current situation and how to, how with a little bit of effort, we can do a little bit more right by our, by our people. So all of those I stole from the military and they've, and they've worked really well for our company. And I think, um, we're not perfect at them. We make mistakes, but I think generally we we do pretty well with them. What Jack? What's what's exciting you now in the industry, and and how how in the next? 12, it might be difficult to answer this, but how how do you how do you see the business model uh, changing over the next twelve months in your industry? What's the opportunities? Yeah, so I think that's a super interesting one. I, I won't get into the nitty gritty nuances of the really technical stuff about our industry, but I do think that a crisis like this presents an opportunity for reinvention. I think that, um, you know, it was, um, uh, there's a quote from Andy Grove, the former uh, Intel CEO that says something to the effect of, you know, uh, in a crisis, you know, bad companies fail and good companies survive and, uh, you know, and outstanding companies um, thrive and they, you know, learn how to reinvent themselves. I, I butchered that quote, but it's something pretty close to that. And I think that, um, a crisis like this gives every single company an opportunity to kind of figure out where you are on that spectrum. And, you know, what I'm excited about at Smartling is, you know, we have an opportunity to reinvent our, ourselves um, with this. I think that, and I'll try to make it sort of more general than just my industry, but the way people buy software and services is going to change. The way that you're going to interact with prospects and customers is going to change. Certainly this year, there will not be big conferences and mm. big in-person events and things that are have been instrumental in, in attracting other customers and prospects and engaging with, with customers. How we service customers is going to, is, is going to change. And for, for my industry, you know, I, the, the translation industry tends to be fairly resilient, even in these types of types of downturns. The Great Recession of 2008, 2009 generally did pretty well from from there. But I, I really do think that that this particular crisis has forced the entire world into something that we're all sharing at the same time. And, you know, you're actually peering into other people's homes when you're on a Zoom meeting with it. That's kind of weird and kind of kind of interesting. And, you know, so I think there's going to be more personalization, more genuine connection with, you know, with, with your people, with customers, with, with prospects and so on. So those are the kinds of, worth, of things that we're thinking about. 
for how we can make sure that SmartLink is that third category of companies that truly thrive and come out of a, of a crisis even stronger than they were before. Jack, that's been great. And I'll tell you what, thanks so much for sharing so many, you know, insights and I can I can really hear it from the heart. So thanks. Thanks very much. If people want to reach out to you, connect with you, find out more about SmartLing, what's the best way that, that they can do that? SmartLing.com, S-M-A-R-T-L-I-N-G.com is our website. And you can find me on LinkedIn, Jack Weldy, W-E-L-D-E. And I'd love to hear from you. David, this has been great. Thanks for having me on the on the show today. And thanks for the great questions. Yeah, you're more than welcome. Speak to you soon. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye. We really hope you enjoyed the podcast today. If you want to listen to more exclusive tips and life lessons from our guest, go to the resources page at vineresources.com. 